Hi, Jean Schnupp here. Welcome to another new Savvy Sightseer video vacation. Today, we will be exploring holiday markets in four European countries. Say it in any language. A holiday or a Christmas market is a popular annual event. It is the go-to destination in December in towns all over the world. Steeped in tradition, some markets trace their roots all the way back to the Middle Ages. Although the deputy to the mayor of Strasbourg declared that French town was the capital of Christmas in 1992, some might argue the point. Equally questionable is which region can lay claim to having the oldest holiday market. Depending on whether you look at how long a market has existed in a spot sometime during the holiday season, or which was the first to use the term Christmas market, any of a number of different countries can lay claim to being the oldest. In Strasbourg, a market started there in 1570, and today locals contend theirs is the oldest in Europe. But Germany's Dresden says it's theirs, first held in 1434, that retains that honor. It's named for the traditional Christmas bread known today as Stalin. But Vienna in Austria is also widely seen as the birthplace of the tradition, where a one-day December market was first held in 1298. It was a place where locals could stock up on foods for the winter, not as the type of market we expect for the holidays today. But they claim it was the front runner. Since all were part of the vast German Empire holdings at the time they started, it's safest to say the oldest Christmas market is a German-based one. And that's why so many people flock to Germany to experience an authentic holiday market. Now we'll visit some of the best in Europe, all centered on the same theme, but dramatically different and unique. We'll start with Belgium, where Liège's Village de Noël is the country's largest and oldest holiday market. It blends old with modern. Then we'll move on over to England's capital city, London. It has no shortage of lively holiday markets popping up everywhere, some with decidedly distinctive aspects. Our third stop will be Valkenburg in the Netherlands, which offers a truly extraordinary atmosphere. Theirs is a subterranean one. We'll end our visit in the country that leads all others in the sheer numbers of markets it has, Germany, which boasts well over 2,000. The famous town of Aachen has earned a place in the annual top 10 best Christmas markets in Europe list, beating out even the much better known Nuremberg market. Liège is about one hour east of Brussels in the rural French-speaking region of Wallonia, and it now considers itself as the capital of European Christmas markets and draws about two million visitors a year. They've got lots to choose from here. 200 wooden chalets are set up offering a range of unusual handicrafts, typical Christmas decorations, live music, costume characters, fun fair rides, lights, and lots of local beer and food that represents Belgium's split personality of both French and Dutch origins. Walking around the market, your nose is greeted by the aroma of roasted nuts, sweet candies, and baked goods. One treat you will see everywhere is the Rocher Coco, or Coconut Rocks. Under King Leopold II, the Congo became his personal possession, so it was the king, not the Belgian government, who owned and controlled the African region, which he deceptively called the Congo Free State. It was the world's only private colony, and Leopold referred to himself as its proprietor. From 1885 to 1908, he administered the Congo in a notoriously brutal manner, using it to expand and showcase his own personal wealth. He imported, or some would say looted, many of its spices, expensive commodities like ivory and rubber, and exotic foods such as coconut. The colony was later taken over by the Belgian government and renamed the Democratic Republic of the Congo. But sometimes these sweets are still referred to as Congolais. Another sweet you'll easily find here is the Coubertin, a raspberry flavored candy with an odd backstory because of its accidental discovery. Many medicines in the 1870s were packaged as a syrup. A pharmacist in Ghent, experimenting on a solid alternative, realized his concoction was unsuitable for medicine, but could be used for something else. The mixture had formed a crust, but the core was still liquid. He made the leap to use the technique to make candy and opened a shop featuring his new suite, where it quickly became a hit. Because of its shape, the dusty-looking purple cone was nicknamed Nozica, or small nose in Dutch. 
The outer shell's texture is soft, like licorice, while the inner is stiffer, like molasses, and it's very sweet. Since they have a shelf life of only a few weeks, they're not exported, so to try one, you have to go to Belgium. One treat you can try here is the Liège waffle. Two main kinds of waffles are in Belgium. The Brussels version are made with a yeast leaven batter, which makes them light and crispy, whereas Liège waffles, pictured on the left here, have a more bread-like dough that contains chunks of pearl sugar, which caramelize and form a crispy, crunchy, golden coating. The dough is spread or pushed into a waffle maker, and the end result is uneven edges and a more dense, sweeter waffle. Slightly crispy on the exterior, but soft and chewy in the center, and best served lightly warmed. Only tourists would think of loading them up with fruit or chocolate. Locals add only powdered sugar. Speckaloos are also everywhere. These are a delightful cookie with about eight different spices, pictured here on the right. Anyone who went to one of my cheeses and chocolates programs, you stirred the chocolate fondue with a smaller version of these. It is hard not to put on a few pounds going through this market with such beautiful French-style pastries. You'll find savory as well as sweets, like mouth-watering spits of ham. Liège sets its market apart from others in the country by expanding the festivities throughout the town and relabeling itself as a Christmas village, complete with its own post office and stamps, and a mayor who wanders around greeting visitors and bringing in citizens of honor. At its town center, Liège's Village de Noël, there's a giant 100-foot Ferris wheel that gives a bird's eye view over the stalls of marzipan, brisket, black pudding, mulled wine, coffee, paquet, which is a type of gin made from juniper berries. There's even champagne, oysters, chocolates, gingerbread, and of course, Christmas beers. Belgians are intense about their beers. Each major brand of beer has its own unique bottle and glass, with the belief that the shape of the glass impacts the beer's flavor or ability to maintain a head. In fact, some breweries have been known to engineer the glass before the beer, and many bars stock the unique glassware for every brand of beer they serve, which could be hundreds. Beer is without doubt the national drink. More distinct types of beer per capita that are produced here than anywhere else in the world. On the average, over 1,100 varieties of beer are produced in Belgium. One thing I noticed when I was there is that outside of the town centers, there's no holiday light displays. These residents definitely wouldn't know what to make of the way some houses here are decorated. Some differences to how Belgians traditionally celebrate the season are that they have a two-stage gift-giving tradition. On December 5th, the eve of St. Nicholas Day, or Sinterklaas, children put shoes by the fireplace or door with a special drawing or cookies, tangerines, or chocolate. They even may leave a carrot for the saint's horse. And of course, they'll be leaving something for Zwarte Pieter, that's Black Peter, who climbs down the chimney and leaves presents for good children. For the bad ones, they'd probably be wishing for coal. Instead, he puts them in a sack and brings them to Spain, where Sinterklaas lives, and they'll be taught to behave properly. On Christmas Eve, the family has an elaborate dinner capped with a la bouche de Noël, a Christmas log cake. Ah, uh, it's a sponge roll with cream covered in chocolate buttercream. Sinterklaas Day is a festive, light-hearted event, whereas Christmas Day is usually more solemn and religious and given over largely to spending time with family and friends. At the market, you could buy a shanche, a puppet, the personification of a stubborn, hard-drinking and sulking person from Liège. Legend has it that he was born in 760 between two cobblestones in outskirts of central Liège. The good people who found him were amazed to hear him sing out as soon as he entered the world and ask for a glass of piquet. Chanché quickly became quite a mischievous kid and a very headstrong person. Or you could pick up Nanès, his female companion, who was courageous and affectionate but did not allow herself to be taken in by his shenanigans. There's also more typical fare, like snow globes. And as mentioned, festivities are not just restricted to the town center. Nearby at the cathedral, there's an ice skating rink that can handle 250 skaters at a time. More chalets ring the rink, and some have traditional comfort foods like fondue. More sporting is done on a toboggan run set up right in the middle of the square. Firmly a part of Belgium's Christmas celebration is the European Circus Festival. 
Begun in 1990 by Belgian native Stefan Adelson, a former trapeze artist, it generally runs from mid-December to January 5th. Over in London, England, there is a slew of markets to pick from. You could choose one like the overly glitzy Winter Wonderland. Definitely not the place for a quiet walk around. It's dubbed the mother of all festive festivals, and they have crammed every conceivable activity into the venue. There's ice skating, and the temporary, largest temporary rink in England can handle up to 400 skaters. There's circus shows, a Ferris wheel that's 200 feet tall, and a huge Christmas market with over 200 chalets. They've got mythical creatures made from ice and snow in the magical Ice Kingdom secret forest. The total scene takes up about 20 acres of Hyde Park's 350 acres. For both a traditional and definitely non-traditional market, all in one place, head to Leicester Square. It's only a few years old, but has become a local favorite. Although much smaller, only about 25 chalets, it still has a little bit of something for everyone. And it starts out about the beginning of November and runs to January 5th. It offers a variety of food, gifts and entertainment, seasonal treats, and delicious drinks. In other words, gallons of mulled wine and bundles of bratwurst. A popular market item to pick up is the Christmas cracker. These cardboard tubes wrapped in paper are typically put next to the dinner plate. They make a little pop when the ends are pulled. Often a small toy or treat and a paper hat are inside. The tradition started in the mid 1800s when sweet maker Tom Smith of London created the crackers to boost sales of his sweets, which he had sold in a twist of paper. As sales of his candy pouches slumped, Smith looked for ways to make them more exciting. He came up with the idea of opening them with a bang inspired by the crackles and sparks coming from his fire as he mulled over the problem one evening. Literally, as I said, there is something for everyone. It offers something of an odd combination of festivities here. On one hand, there's Santa's Grotto, but then there's also a burlesque style review. The performance is in a 1920s style Belden Spiegel tent. That's a traveling pavilion used as a dance hall and wine tasting marquee since the early 20th century. Tickets for both events are sold on the same website, so maybe don't let the kids do the ticket ordering online. The show combines the worlds of circus, comedy, cabaret, subversive performance, and contemporary vaudeville, and the organizers say it promises a night of laughs, gasps, naughtiness, and the best in cheeky adult cabaret. Not what some might consider typical Christmas fare. Some markets are enhanced by their location, such is the case with the real food market outside King's Cross train station. Arriving in the historic station, which recently underwent a 547 million pound renovation to the structure that first opened in 1852, visitors are unprepared for the graceful mix of modern and Victorian. Central to the redesign is the shell-like roof of diagonally intersecting glass, steel, and aluminum that rises about 66 feet above the ground at its highest point. The vast canopy splays out from a great steel funnel located just a few feet from the historic station's Victorian-era western brick facade. Stepping out of the station, you come to a truly traditional market, one that gets back past all the hoopla of Ferris wheels and to the food markets that were at the core of the originals. And so, after all the entertainment and gifts bought at other markets, then it's time to think about what will take center stage on the big day, whether that's Christmas or Boxing Day. Boxing Day, a big tradition in Britain for over 800 years, is the day after Christmas and is still an official bank holiday. Originally, it was a day when the church opened its alms box and gave the proceeds to the poor. It was deemed the servant's day off, and lords of the manor gave them small gifts in boxes. Christmas Day dinner is served in the early afternoon and is generally a festive meal. Goose or beef were traditionally the main dish, but more today it's a roast turkey with all the trimmings. Remember, they didn't get to have that uh, because they don't celebrate Thanksgiving. There'll be Christmas pudding and mince pies, and dessert could be a trifle. My mother-in-law made the best. It was a sponge cake soaked in sherry or brandy, or maybe in Scotland whiskey, topped with fruit, custard, and whipped cream. The King's Cross Christmas Market is an extension of real food markets, which was started in 2007 as a means to, quote, encourage people to reconnect to where their food comes from 
and to support and help smaller producers. The usual three-day weekly market is expanded in mid-December to daily for the Christmas market season. Organizers say they believe in the power of good food and that it can bring people together to create a better, healthier world around us. I'm not so sure how healthy some of these offerings are. Setting up outside King's Cross Station was a carefully selected venue. The organizer's goal is to provide as much convenience to great food as possible. They say we are up against the supermarket, but by finding locations where there is already a high footfall, we can offer people an easy way to buy fresh, high quality, real food at honest prices. Here you have some confections unique to Scotland. Tablets are sweet, fudge-like, extremely sugary candy. It's medium hard and melts in the mouth, uh, a traditional after-dinner sweet and typical at Christmas or special events, like a Scottish wedding. Evidence suggests the tablet goes back to at least the early 1700s. One secret is supposedly the hand stirring, which takes a long time, perhaps a way to keep antsy kids busy. Ecclefechan tarts are named for a Scottish town bordering England, and they're more associated with Hogmanay, that's New Year's Eve, which was traditionally celebrated more than Christmas in Scotland. The very buttery nut and caramel tarts made their way to England in 2007, when a supermarket chain offered them as an alternative to another longtime holiday treat. The mince pie, which is a big part of the English holiday tradition. Back in Henry VIII's time, suet nut butter was used, and dried fruit, spices, and shredded meat were all very expensive, and so only the wealthy could enjoy them. One tradition today has that the family should bake 12 pies and eat one on each of the 12 days of Christmas to ensure good luck in every month of the coming year. To thank Father Christmas or Santa Claus for the presents he puts into stockings or pillowcases that are hung by the fireside or bed on Christmas Eve, a mince pie and possibly a brandy is left out for him. By the way, Santa knows just what to bring because children write their wishes in a letter that they then throw into the fire. He reads the smoke and makes his list. The site of our next market is pretty nondescript on the outside, where there isn't much left to an 11th century castle. Stone quarried from underground caves was used to build the once mighty fortress. Valkenburg was the Netherlands' only hilltop castle. It was repeatedly besieged and rebuilt and expanded over the decades until it was ultimately left in ruins after being bombed in 1672. The caves weren't discovered until the early 1900s during a restoration and soon became a tourist destination. In 1985, the town opened the first of its subterranean Christmas markets. The Romans started to work in these caves about 2,000 years ago when they began mining the ground for marl, that's a clay lime soil, and they needed that as building material for the Valkenburg Castle. The result of this marl stone mining is an extensive labyrinth of old and rugged passageways, which medieval knights once used as an escape route. But now, tourists use them to escape the usual rat race of holiday shopping. Inside, the temperature is a steady about 50, 55 degrees Fahrenheit. It is the largest, oldest, and most visited underground Christmas market in Europe. There are two of these subterranean markets. The first opened was this, whose name translates to Municipal Cave. It is open from mid-November until the end of the year. Notice the map to the left that shows the different trails within one cave. To give you a better sense of this environment, There's lots to choose from here, including traditional home village pieces. There's quite a variety of illuminated pictures. There's also wood animal carvings, candles, and of course, homemade foods, fudge, candy, and jams. And there's a reminder of what the market is there for in the first place. Traditions here are very similar to their neighbor in Belgium. Sinterklaas arrives on the night of December 5th, but he and his sidekick, Zwarte Pieter, come from Spain by boat and select a different harbor each year to arrive at in the Netherlands. 
Once on land, he gets on a white horse to distribute gifts to deserving children. And the bad ones are scooped up by Black Peter on December 6th. They board a boat and sail out of Rotterdam, the Netherlands' major port. An added bonus is the cave artwork, ancient sketches depicting old legends, portraits, and sculptures. And murals and scenes from the Middle Ages to the present appear on walls and in nooks along the route. Some are quite detailed. When not set up as a Christmas market, the cave is quite a tourist draw, offering guided tours during which the origins and history of the municipal caves are explored, the artwork is examined and explained, and there's even a light and sound spectacle. The entrance to the second cave, and what's translated as the Velvet Market, is hard to miss. Mining began here in 1050, when the construction of the castle started and ended sometime around 1886. There are three miles of passageways here. It's hard to come away without finding something that you can buy. Art in the Velvet Market is a little different and goes back just over two centuries. In 1944, this cave served as a refuge to hundreds of citizens of Valkenburg during World War II, as well as to American soldiers stationed here who etched their names, hometowns, and doodles on the soft walls of the cave. In addition to unique drawings, this cave has another special attraction. During the French occupation, at the end of the 18th century, Napoleon closed down all the churches in the Netherlands and forced Roman Catholic priests to swear allegiance to France. Those who refused were exiled. During this time, secret chapels sprung up throughout the area, like this one in the Velvet Cave. It was founded by a priest in 1797. This tiny chapel was the site of many secret masses. Baptismal fonts, altars, and memorials to priests who were imprisoned or exiled were cut out of the soft chalk. Valkenburg's market spills out of the caves and throughout the town itself, which continues holiday shopping through January 5th. Busy shoppers can grab a food fix on the run as shacks like these serving up cones of Santa's frites. You can call them patat, or as the fries are called in the northern Netherlands, or frit in the southern Netherlands, or of course, Belgian frites after their actual country of origin, but don't call them French fries. A popular theory for the inaccurate naming is that American soldiers in Belgium during World War I were in South Belgium, where French is the dominant language, and so they dubbed the treat French fries. The secret to these enormously popular treats, the Dutch run a close second in per capita consumption with the Belgians, is twice frying at two different temperatures with cooling in between. Equally important is the topping. Most popular is a mound of mayo. Curry and chili are also hot choices, but the most distinctive is dubbed the Dutch War. That's the sort of battlefield of mayo on one side, peanut satay on the other, with a line of raw onion toppings spread between the two. The quiet little town of Aachen by Germany's western border with Belgium is small in size but massive in history. Thirty thermal springs there are said to be the hottest in Central Europe and were used for treating rheumatic and muscular disorders uh, as far back, it is believed, as the Neolithic times. In early Roman days, it was a walled city, with this remaining gate to remind visitors that it was such an important town that it warranted a protective wall. Aachen's original holiday market was just for selling the town's signature printing the recipe for which was passed down from generation to generation and is a carefully guarded secret among families. Classic printing are crunchy, actually kind of jaw-breaking, and they suggest that you suck on them, don't bite them. But now there's also a soft version. You don't have to walk far in Aachen to find printing. The hardest part is deci deciding what type to get. Two main bakeries dominate the printing sales in the Christmas market and tempt shoppers with free samples. You can easily gain five pounds just sampling. The display on the left belongs to Klein, which has operated since 1912. Nobis on the right has been in business since uh, 1858. Two giant 20-foot printing even welcome visitors to the market from late November to late December, with the stunning town hall as its backdrop. At one time, Aachen was not only the seat of imperial administration, but also the most influential center of culture in Europe. The town hall stands on the site of what had been a palatial complex for Charlemagne, the first emperor of the Romans, and what was later to become known as the Holy Roman Empire. 
he had made Aachen his home base. The complex included a school for which he recruited the best teachers in the land and encouraged women to be educated. The town hall forms one bookend to a central rectangular marketplace crammed with wooden chalets and shoppers, mulled wine samples, and the popular carousel. The other bookend is the fabulous Aachen Cathedral, making this the perfect backdrop for a Christmas market. Its cathedral is the oldest in Europe, commissioned in 780 AD by Charlemagne, who was crowned here in 800 AD. So it's no surprise that Christmas time draws not just shoppers here, but the religious as well. Unlike its neighbors, Sinterklaas is not the star of the German Christmas season. Martin Luther had replaced St. Nicholas with a Christkind or Christ child and moved the big celebration to Christmas Eve. The idea is that it's the Christ child who delivers the gifts. But Germans had a hard time buying that a baby Jesus ran around delivering gifts. So in many German towns, the gift giver morphed into a sweet girl called the Christ child. She's an angelic figure with blonde hair and wings and is generally chosen through a contest. She has a serious job through the Advent season, reading fairy tales to children and doing meet and greets with shoppers. Not only do vendor chalets fill the 400 foot long courtyard between those two impressive buildings, they also spill out into the streets and squares nearby. About two million visitors come over for the market's four week run. Unusual displays set this market apart from others. For example, who wants to buy just a, jar, a bar, bar of chocolate when you could get one that's shaped like a faucet or a wrench? Or maybe you want to have uh, your chocolate as wearable art, like a watch. German Advent stars are colorful ways to light up the holiday season. These illuminated decorations are a modernized version of the Froebel star, named for the German educator Friedrich Froebel, the founder of the kindergarten concept. He used paper folding activities activities to demonstrate basic math principles. These pricey Nicholas dolls seem more troll looking to me and not exactly saintly. For the serious baker, nowhere offers more cookie cutters. I lost my friend here for 45 minutes as she bought about 120 euros worth of them. For an interactive souvenir, look for an authentic German smoker. They first came into existence in the late 1600s in Southeast Germany but didn't really catch on until the mid-1800s. Local artisans designed these tiny figures by carving and turning them out of a single piece of wood, and incense was placed on a tray next to the figurines. Burning incense is a traditional part of the German Christmas culture. It is believed to ward off evil spirits and traditionally is used through the holidays up to January 6th or the Epiphany. Incense cones were developed about the late 1700s, and then the smokers were made from two pieces of wood that fit together, allowing for the incense to burn inside the smoker, and the smoke then directed through an opening, like a mouth or a chimney. One of the things that make German smokers so unique and popular is that they are generally carved in the image of the everyday person, rather than political, military, or religious figures. Typical smokers are like these, bakers or miners, shepherds, farmers, chimney sweepers, carpenters, and so forth. Many know that we have Germany to thank for a lot of our Christmas traditions, singing Silent Night and bringing the tree indoors, as Martin Luther is credited with doing first. But not so many know that even the decorations we put on the tree also harken back to Germany. Glass ornaments were invented in 1847 by Hans Greiner in the little town of Lausche, where his ancestor established the first glass works in 1597. Initially, the ornaments were hand-blown and styled as fruits and nuts. When the United Kingdom's Prince Albert started importing decorations from his native Germany and putting them on the indoor Royal Victorian tree, which he also popularized in Britain, a tradition was born worldwide. F.W. Woolworth visited the Griner Glassworks in the 1880s and over time bought over 200,000 of these baubles to ship back to his eager American customers. By the close of the 19th century, the Five and Dime store reportedly had sold the equivalent of $25 million worth. All this shopping can work up an appetite, and fortunately, Printon isn't the only sweet in town. German apple tart, covered with warmed cream, can't be beat on a cool afternoon. Christmas is generally the time you'll find another popular German treat at the market, called a domino tile. 
These were invented by a German chocolate maker in Dresden in 1936. He was looking for a cheaper alternative to his expensive pralines. He created a layered sweet with a base of gingerbread topped with sour cherry or apricot jelly, and then a layer of marzipan, all coated with chocolate. Today, a so-called white chocolate covered domino is also available. Of course, you can't fully enjoy a German market without having a bratwurst while sampling mulled wine or good German brew. Another popular holiday tradition in Germany is to follow the Romantic Road, a 220 mile scenic route from Würzburg to Versen in search of other Christmas markets. The route bends gracefully through lovely countryside and quaint towns. In medieval times, it was a trade route that connected the center of Germany with the south. But in 1950, it became a trade route of an entirely different kind, with the trade being tourism. It's basically a marketing idea which appears to be based on history and tradition, but which is actually a much more modern invention. In post-war times, Germany was desperate to rebuild the tourism industry, and the idea of a formal romantic road route was created and promoted. It has stops at some of Germany's most beautiful and iconic places, like Neuschwanstein, Med King Ludwig's fanciful castle, and charming Rottenburg. This is Germany's best-preserved walled Roman town and gives new meaning to picturesque with its half-timbered medieval houses and town square. It provides a one-and-a-half-mile walk above the town. Christmas is a major part of Rottenburg's history. Its town square hosts one of the most famous Christmas marketplaces during the holiday season, and it has done so as far back as the 15th century. Tradition is strong and little has changed, so it is a glimpse at over 500 years of living heritage. In fact, the town's been dubbed Germany's Christmas capital. But you don't have to wait until December to enjoy the holidays in Rottenberg. That can be done with a visit to Cate Walpart's Christmas Village Shop. The holiday can be celebrated any time of year with a walk through the family-owned shop that has been a fixture here since 1977. A walk through the store is a treat for old and young. The heart of the shop is designed like a medieval German village with snow-covered houses, thousands of twinkling stars, and winding cobblestone streets. In 2000, the family realized a long-time dream to open the first permanent exhibition in Germany of the country's Christmas traditions. Historical decorations were collected to represent different areas of German culture and span decades of holiday customs from 1870 through 1950. It's no surprise the family chose Rotenberg then for their shop and museum. I like to end all of my programs by paraphrasing the words of Dr. Seuss. Sometimes you don't appreciate the moment until it becomes a memory, and I like to add to that to always remember to celebrate the moments and treasure the memories. I hope that you have enjoyed this trip through the uh, European markets. If you have any questions about the program, email me or use the contact page on my website. Of course, I also invite you to visit my website to see more of the countries we visited today or any of my European destinations. When libraries are again offering in-person programs, you can check my programs tab to see where I'll be. Until then, visit the library site for more video vacations by Savvy Sightseer. Happy holidays to all.